Sup, you beautiful bastards. Hope you're having a fantastic Monday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing we're gonna talk about today and an intro to a story I never expected, we have Eminem and Andrea Russett in the news together. Never could have really predicted that pairing, but this has to do with something that happened over the weekend at Bonnaroo. Reportedly during his set, Eminem used some sound effects that some fans thought resembled gunshots. It happened three separate times during his performance. And so in the wake of so many mass shootings, whether it be at a school or like at a concert like we saw in Vegas, there were Many fans that were panicked, angry, some actually left the concert. One fan tweeting, Being at a festival slash concert in these current times brings new concerns and fears. I had to leave Eminem set after third gunshot at Bonnaroo because panic was setting in my section, front pit. Extremely realistic and scary. Would have been good to have a warning before show, hashtag irresponsible. And as far as what these people were actually hearing, here are two examples from two different songs. One of the reasons this story blew up, and as fast as it did, is that Andrea Russett, who has over 7.8 million Twitter followers, was in attendance and was upset, saying in now deleted tweets, I hate to be the one to say it, but being someone who suffers from very mild PTSD, it was extremely irresponsible and distasteful to end songs with a shotgun sound effect. I have grown up loving Eminem and his music, but I was extremely triggered to the point of tears. Adding, to hear a gunshot sound effect and see the entire crowd drop to the floor out of instinct is not funny, cute, or amusing. This is the sad reality that we are living. This is not funny or even something to be joked about. And in addition to her, there were also others that were upset. And on the other side, you had people that were defending Eminem. People arguing that Eminem has had these sounds in his sets for years, but people didn't complain then. People saying those making a big deal about this are just trying to get attention. And as far as any input from Eminem's team, right now his team is saying that those aren't actually even gunshot sounds. A spokesperson for Eminem saying, Contrary to inaccurate reports, Eminem does not use gunshot sound effects during his live show. The effect used by Eminem in his set at Bonnaroo was a pyrotechnic concussion, which creates a loud boom. He has used this effect, as have hundreds of other artists in his live show for over 10 years, including previous US festival dates in 2018 without complaint. And I will say to me, when I look at that video, it looks like they're telling the truth because you see a flash from on stage and then that sound. And as of right now, it appears that Eminem will be keeping things the same and not making any changes. And personally, I do not think that Eminem does need to change anything. But that's my personal takeaway, and I'll pass the question off to you because we're all different people here. Well, what, what are your thoughts on this? So we live in a different time, so things should be done differently or include some sort of warning, or no, the songs are the songs and the performance is the performance. And then and let's knock out some quickie news. First up, we had IHOP, the International House of Pancakes, changing their name to IHOB. They, for a little bit, have been teasing this name change, saying, hey, can you guess what the B stands for? I was personally in the camp of, oh, it probably means breakfast, but it turns out it's burgers. The International House of Burgers. Now, for those people that are worried that IHOP will no longer serve pancakes because apparently those people exist, uh, the company said they will continue selling them. And actually, in the midst of the massive internet reaction, the company said that the change is just temporary. Which really made me go from thinking this was one of the most idiotic moves a company has made since Netflix had that whole quickster situation, to now just really appreciating what a smart marketing move this is. They knew this was going to get massive media attention, massive online attention, all the regular players would chime in, including Wendy's going for their throat, and they capitalized on what we've seen time and time again, but with real situations, for millions and millions and millions of dollars of free promotion for a thing I didn't even know they had burgers. It's genius. Granted, I will still not eat there. If I'm gonna eat food in an establishment that I know that it's gonna be bad for me, I'm gonna go to Roscoe's. I'm gonna get the chicken and waffles, I'll eat it, I'm gonna get into a food coma, and I don't have to actively think about the poor life choices I'm making. But for now, where I'll end this is just a, a tip of my cab over to you, IHOP. I initially thought the move was pretty stupid, but uh, you proved me wrong. Then we had ABC apologizing for something that didn't involve one of their people comparing someone to looking like an ape. Instead, this time it involved Priyanka Chopra and her show Quantico. The show threw itself into this very polarizing, controversial political situation between Hindus and Muslims, India, and Pakistan. And the episode people were angry about was called The Blood of Romeo. It portrayed Indians as terrorists looking to attack New York and blaming Pakistan. As far as Chopra's involvement, we see her discover a Hindu symbol on a suspect. And following the episode, there were a ton of people angry at Chopra, who is Indian, saying that she was betraying her people and Hinduism. And with Chopra, it's a massive deal because she is extremely well-liked in India. She's one of the country's highest paid actresses. She's also the first Bollywood actress to land a leading role in a primetime American television show. And in addition to the general anger, there were also many that thought it was unfair that Indians and Hindus could be portrayed this way. But in the past, former showrunner Josh Safran said that he would never feature a Muslim terrorist on the show. So you had some fans angry saying, well, why would you then feature a Hindu terrorist rather than a Muslim terrorist? It, it, both are negative. So you had people saying it's ridiculous that one group can't be portrayed as something, but definitely everyone else, that, that's fair game. But since the initial backlash, the outrage, it does appear that things have settled down since ABC, Chopra, and executives have apologized. ABC even taking the step in front of Chopra to defend her, pointing out that Chopra didn't make the show, nor does she direct or write it, adding that they inadvertently 
suddenly and regrettably stepped into a complex political issue. And the network ended up pulling the episode before it could air in India. So there was that. But from that, I want to share some stuff I love today. And today in Awesome, brought to you by Squarespace. Whether you need a domain, website, online store, make it with Squarespace. It's so easy to make a beautiful website with Squarespace's intuitive all-in-one platform. There's nothing to install, patch, or upgrade ever. And if you ever get lost, you can use their award-winning 24-7 customer service. So if you want to make the smart move like many from the nation already have, go to squarespace.com slash Phil. And when you love it, enter offer code Phil for 10% off your first purchase. And the first bit of awesome really shouldn't be that surprising. So much E3 awesome. And I'm going to link to pretty much all of the announcements down below. But some of the standouts to me, you got an announcement for Halo Infinite. You got a trailer and first looks at Fallout 76, which I, I am, I'm a, I'm a little skeptical, but I am still excited. We got some Kingdom Hearts 3 that's going to come out January 29th, 2019. I'm excited about Dying Light 2. We got a badass trailer for Cyberpunk 2077. Elder Scrolls 6 was announced. As far as indie games, Sea of Solitude looks really interesting. But of course, like I said, there, there's a ton more that I didn't even include here. There, there's a bunch more going to be announced. And also, of course, remember, even though this segment is called Today and Awesome, when it comes to things announced at E3, just, just understand that uh, some of it, some would argue a lot of it, will not live up to the hype that you see today. We got a trailer for Kidding, starring Jim Carrey. We also had Queer Eyes Fab Five sharing the 10 best tips from season one. And if you want to see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. Then in really that happened news, we appropriately go to Florida. Turns out an office of the Inspector General investigation found that in February of 2016, the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services stopped accessing the FBI's National Instant Criminal Background Check System. And if you're unfamiliar with the NIS, ICS, it's the system that allows states and firearms retailers to check the criminal and mental health history of applicants. It flags people that have been in jail or convicted of a drug offense in the past year or undocumented immigrants or involuntarily committed or deemed to have a mental defect by a court or were dishonorably discharged. And in Florida, this system is specifically used to background check concealed carry applicants for any out-of-state offenses. And as far as the reason why, oh, you're gonna love this. According to the investigation, the reason for this is that the employee that was responsible for these checks forgot her login information. And that employee was Lisa White and the investigation found that she waited 40 days before reporting the issue to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. And even then, when she did report the issue, she used a public email instead of directly contacting someone for assistance. And even then, the email had to be forwarded to the correct person who then informed her that she was using the wrong user name. And even after that, she still reported having issues which one employee at the FDLE said he could have fixed over the phone. But unfortunately, she didn't follow up and she also didn't answer when the FDLE employee called her. And it wasn't until March of 2017 where another employee questioned why the department had not received any notice of denial. And that is what ultimately led to this situation being discovered. And according to an interview with investigators, Wild said, I dropped the ball. I know I did that. I should have been doing it and I didn't. But also saying in an interview with the Tampa Bay Times that she was overwhelmed with a number of applications and under pressure to approve background checks quickly. Also saying that she was given this oversight when she was working in the mailroom, saying, quote, I didn't understand why I was put in charge of it. And from that ridiculous part, let's let's talk about the numbers. What actually happened during this period of time? Well, reportedly during this period, there were 268,000 applications that were approved. 6,400 70 were denied, but it was for reasons like incomplete application or they were ineligible. But according to the Agriculture Commissioner Adam Putnam, there were only 365 that actually required background checks and did not receive them. But then after the report, they were performed and 291 permits were revoked. And I will say to me, it, it does feel like the Department of Agriculture is trying to minimize this situation. Aaron Keller, who's a spokesperson for the department, pointed out that it was one employee, noting that they have terminated that employee, and then adding that the database is used for, quote, non-criminal disqualifying offenses. And during this time, all applications had undergone on criminal background checks through two other databases. But of course, you still have people saying, no, this is still a massive deal. You're talking about a background check system that, yes, is supposed to see if someone is a criminal. But also, and of course, this is very relevant to the debate around guns in Florida, people who were involuntarily committed or deemed to have a mental defect by a court. And then when that background check system was put back into play, you had to revoke 291. Still understandable why this is a massive deal to a lot of people. And of course, like with all the stories, I'd love to know your thoughts on this. And then let's talk about something that could greatly impact the entire internet. And first off, it would be a disservice if I didn't mention, of course, today, June 11, we're seeing the official repeal of major net neutrality provisions going into effect. We, of course, have talked about that situation multiple times in the past. There still is a fight taking place. There was, of course, a resolution against the appeal that passed through the Senate, but it is very unlikely to get through the House. And even there, it's very unlikely that Donald Trump would sign it. Most likely he would veto it. You also have more than 20 states and D.C. suing the FCC over this. Other states 
have passed new laws, others are trying to pass new laws. It, it, there's a continued fight there. And down below, I'll link to Battle for the Net and other resources so you can kind of stay in the know while this takes place. But today we need to talk about the EU. And to talk about what's happening now and in the next two weeks, we need to first jump back to 2016. There we saw the former EU Digital Commissioner proposing new copyright reforms. And they ended up being known as the EUCD, the EU Copyright Directive. And supporters of the EUCD said that the changes were supposed to update European copyright laws for the digital age. And since then, the EUCD made its way through different committees, subcommittees, other fun places. And then it went to the Legal Affairs Committee where MEP Axel Voss was tasked with finding compromises across the amendments that EU member states submitted. After that, it would then be ratified as a final version and then Parliament would vote on it. And as far as why we're talking about this today, the Legal Affairs Committee will be voting June 20th on a final version to be presented to the European Parliament. And that's a massive deal because once it's out of committee, it is extremely hard to have further amendments added. And the thing I wanna point out here is that the EUCD is massive and, and we do not have enough time to cover the entire thing, but we can talk about a few of the more controversial parts. And we'll start with one of the smaller points of debate, which is Article 3. Article 3 is a change to how data mining works in the EU. Right now, data mining is pretty much banned in the EU, but Article 3 would open it up. Here you have groups upset because they say it does not go far enough, that the proposed changes will only allow research institutions to mine for the purposes of scientific research. Here, critics say that this will effectively stop innovation. Large-scale AIs require input from users all over to train them, and so this would effectively stop that. Because of the restrictions, independent researchers, journalists, hobbyists would also be banned from data mining, adding that this denies EU startups a level playing field. Because essentially, if you're not an established institution like a university, you don't get to do what they do. Then we have Article 11, what is being called the Link Tax. This provision would restrict both businesses and individuals who publish news snippets. Essentially, anyone using snippets of journalistic online content must first get a license from the publisher, and that new right for publishers would apply for 20 years after publication. And this would target automatic link previews that social networks generate when users share links. Like example, when you're on Twitter or Facebook, you link out to something, it often shows the headline, a thumbnail picture, maybe a little short piece of the content. Additionally, it's likely this would affect news aggregators, media monitoring services, fact-checking services. And the supposed goal here is that it would protect traditional press revenues by forcing people to go to the sites rather than hearing about the articles via third parties or just short pieces. And if an online source like Google fails to get the license, the copyright holder can force Google to remove the link. And the European Digital Commission says that they want to mostly target links on Google, Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest. Also, an important and interesting note here is a law like this already exists in Germany and Spain, and it has failed in both. In Germany, many are saying it is likely that it is going to die in court, whereas with the Spanish law, according to the EU Research Service, it has clearly had negative impact on visibility and access to information in Spain. And the EFF says it's a de facto attack on hyperlinks. Not a lot of people are going to click a link without a preview of what they're clicking. Limitations on snippets are essentially a limitation on linking. And it's also believed by some groups that this will encourage fake news. This, because propaganda departments likely won't charge for snippets because it's all about getting to as many people as possible, whereas reputable sources likely will. Additionally, Article 11 is also in conflict with the Berne Convention. That being an international treaty that guarantees a right to quote news articles and create press summaries. But from that, let's talk about Article 13, which is being called the Upload Filter. Here, internet platforms hosting large amounts of user uploaded content must monitor user behavior and filter their contributions to identify and prevent copyright infringement. This is supposed to protect the music industry. The industry believes and lobby that the revenue Google shares with them from running ads on videos containing their content amounts to too little compared to payments from subscription services like Spotify, calling this the value gap. So the question becomes, okay, well, what does this actually look like? Well, in YouTube's case, music copyright holders can demand that once YouTube has a sample of their music, they must have a system to flag anything uploaded automatically and that the copyrighted material is never re-uploaded. And YouTube already has a system that is similar to this, but they want it to be bigger, faster, more responsive, as well as automatically take those videos down. But it's also not just the music industry that's affected. Platforms like Instagram will also be subject to this as these rules extend to photos and videos. Here, a copyright holder can inform Instagram to keep an eye out for their copyrighted photos and Instagram will automatically need to take it down if it's re-uploaded. One of the arguments against Article 13 is they're calling this a startup killer. And that's because it places huge costs on very small companies to have massive systems in place to monitor what's being uploaded super closely. And Google even cautioned against such rules back in a blog post from 2016. It's also believed that this would have unintended consequences for sites like Wikipedia. They would need to have these filters in place at massive cost, even though Wikipedia only accepts freely licensed uploads. And one of the final things with Article 13 is it would likely be in violation of existing EU law, specifically the e-commerce directive, which forbids general monitoring obligations, something that the European Parliament Research Service says Article 13 would establish. And unfortunately, that is not the end of the concerns. The EUCD is often vaguely worded, and there are fears that common aspects of internet culture may be affected unintentionally. For example, reaction GIFs would likely be classified as copyright infringement under the EUCD. Additionally, most memes would also die for the same reason, since they often included copyrighted material. This could also hit fan fictions as well as lib dubs, which is essentially all of Musical.ly. Another huge issue is because of the way the EUCD is written right now, it doesn't include exceptions for things like fair use. So there, parody and criticism content could be struck down if the copyright holder wanted it to be. And as of right now, it is hard not to feel like that is also maybe 
the intent. Culture Committee MEP Sylvie Gillard has tried proposing that exceptions be put in place to allow digital use of quotations or extracts of works. This within user-generated content for purposes such as criticism, review, entertainment, illustration, caricature, parody, or pastiche. But as of right now, it doesn't seem our proposals have gotten very far. But even then, let's say the exception gets put into place, there are still concerns that monitoring software conforming to the upload filter can't properly tell what's infringed material and what is something like parody or criticism. I mean, not to completely crap all over YouTube, but look at the system they have in place and how often you see some of your favorite creators going, oh, got dinged again. So it essentially take an already annoying, somewhat destructive system and then potentially make it catastrophic. And so ultimately that is where we are right now. And like I said, on June 20th, that is when it will be voted on. In today's video, I just covered three articles, some of the concerns there, but I'll link to the full document down below. Additionally, if you live in the EU and any of this is concerning to you, I will link you down below to saveyourinternet.eu. There, they make it incredibly easy to tweet, email, or call your MEP. And of course, I will say, while any action is a good action, some of the most effective action you can take is a call. And for now, that is where this story ends and we wait. Personally, I am of the mindset of this needs massive reform or just needs to be shut down and something started from scratch. I mean, it's easy to think of the situation as, oh, okay, that's, that's a European Union problem, but it's also a worldwide problem when you consider that everyone is kind of international these days. YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, they're not just American companies. We, we live in an international age. This is a big deal for a lot of people. But with that said, of course, this is the Philip DeFranco Show, whether it be the last story, the first one, anything in between. I'd love to know your thoughts in those comments down below. And that's where I'm going to end today's show. And remember, if you liked this video, you like what I'm trying to do on this channel, hit that like button, maybe even ring that bell. Also remember, if you missed the last Philip DeFranco Show, you want to catch up, click or tap right there to watch that. Or maybe you need something lighter, you can watch the brand new behind the scenes vlog we uploaded today right here. But that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.